Okay, so today we're gonna continue our discussion by talking about scattering matrices, S matrices in quantum field theory. So I'll quickly go over what we discussed in the previous lecture. And if there are questions at any point, please feel free to uh, ask and stop me. Um, all right, if you think that I'm going over something quick, you uh, definitely let me know. So what we did in the last lecture was that we quantized uh, fermions um, using, uh, we quantized fermions using path intervals. We did this using the coherent state formalism, if you recall, we said that the coherent states provide an overcomplete basis and the overlaps uh, were of the ket bracket Z prime Z was E to the power of minus Z, uh, Z prime star Z. Um, this was something that we used to, we, we went through this in the quantization of simple harmonic oscillator, bosonic and fermionic. Um, and we saw that when we're dealing with fermions, uh, we had to talk about Gras Grassmann valued um, things. In the case of QFT, it becomes Grassmann valued functions. And then it was important that we saw, similar to the case of scalar, we ended up with a phase phase path interval. However, as opposed to the case of scalar, we couldn't do the um, canonical conjugate path interval. Over there, if V, the potential was only a function of phi, we could perform the momentum part uh, of the path integral. But here, the whole thing is a path integral in the phase space. And in part, it's just the fact that psi and psi bar are canonical conjugates. So the canonical conjugate of phi is not phi dot. All right, so the partition of the generating functional is a functional of Grassmannian sources. These are functions, eta and eta bar of uh, space time. And they couple in the following way to the fermion and the anti-fermion. Um, the um, yeah, so this is this is analogous to uh, the the case of scalar field where we couple j as a source to the scalar phi. Over there, we're doing everything uh, in the real space because we perform the path integral uh, over the moment over the momentum space over the canonical conjugate uh, canonical conjugate. Uh, so we only had one source here. We had have a pair of sources. For free drag fermion in three plus one dimensions, we saw that the action is basically the Dirac action. This del slash is gamma mu uh, del mu. These are four by four matrices, even though I write it like this, but this is to be understood as I gamma mu del mu minus M times four by four identity matrix, right? Um, the Generating functional, we evaluated it because this action is Gaussian. Well, it's actually this linear in sin psi bar. And what we found was that optimal normalization is very similar to the uh, case of uh, free scalar. It's e to the power of i integral of eta bar s eta. Eta and eta bar are the sources. S is the Green's function for Dirac equation, otherwise known as the fermion propagator. The expression that we found in the case of scalar was exactly the same. It was phi propagator phi with a minus half outside, minus half over two outside. So it's basically the same structure that we find here. That we discussed the Schrodinger Dyson equation for fermions, which is uh, the analog of equations of motion as a differential operator acting on the uh, acting on the generating functional is zero here, the role of the field variables are played by del, del, del i, del eta bar, that's the role of psi, and uh, eta plays the role of psi bar, it's just because of the, the, the way that we have sourced things. There's also an equation for uh, eta, where here you have eta bar and here you have eta, right? So there are two equations. All right, any questions about this part? We did this in the last lecture. All right. Okay. Um, then we talked about this propagator, right? This propagator up here. 
This is a, in real space, we wrote it as, uh, so ISF is the fermion propagator in real space X and Y. These are four coordinates, right? For X mu and Y mu, but for simplicity, I just write them as X, Y to keep the notation clean. This I gamma mu del mu minus M plus I epsilon. This I epsilon is time ordering. We said that in path integrals, when you perform uh, what comes out naturally, a path integral is always time order. Um, we call this a Feynman propagator. These are, again, I repeat, these are four by four matrices. In momentum space, the propagator becomes algebraic. So momentum space fermion propagator, ISF K mu after Fourier transform is just inverse one over K mu gamma mu minus M plus I epsilon. Again, these are matrices and we usually use a notation of slash K slash. So we saw that if you take this guy and multiply it with the same thing with the plus sign, you get the equations of a, a Klein-Gordon equation. So I could factor this out in this form. This is just a convenient form that we write so that down here, it looks like the Klein-Gordon propagator, but up here we have uh, this, this expression. Um, so hopefully you, you recall that the, the way that this works was that if when you multiply this by the same thing with plus here, we had to use the Dirac algebra to obtain uh, something that's proportional to identity, right? Um, yeah, you can go back to the that lecture. So Dirac algebra is um, this, whoops. So Dirac algebra, I just remind you, is a to mu nu. Um, yeah, this is the Dirac identity. All right. Then we wrote this down in the chiral basis because I keep saying if these are four by four matrices. So to be very explicit, you could write it in this form. This is the uh, propagator for a scalar. And up here, you have M identity, M identity. And this is K mu and K mu. These are this, this is two by two, two by two, two by two, two by two. These are the uh, chiral uh, Pauli matrices and the antichiral Pauli matrices, right? So hopefully you recall that from the representation theory of uh, Lorentz group. Then we discussed the Feynman rules for fermions. Well, the propagator is the same thing as before. We just draw a line between points X and Y in real space. But now we keep in mind that there's an arrow, which is the direction of the flow of the charge. We will need such an arrow when we draw, when we are doing uh, Feynman diagrams for for uh, complex scalar field as well, because we have particle antiparticle this phi and phi dagger, right? So there's charge, there's U one charge, and this is similar to that. So it's only the real scalar where it doesn't matter, right? Because the particle antiparticle is the same. Then as a sample use, as, a, as an example of using these rules, we said that in QED, we have the following interaction. This is a Dirac fermion that is coupled to the gauge field, the photon, right? And in the following word, this is the interaction. There is a vertex. This is the photon, fermion, fermion, um, right? And the vertex is the value, the contribution of the vertex to the uh, Feynman diagrams is minus I E gamma mu. The electric charge here plays the role of the coupling, right? So here's the electric charge. An important thing about the fermions to keep in mind is that as opposed to bosons, so similar to bosons, every loop comes with an integral over the momentum, the internal momentum that run, runs along the loop. But for the case of fermions, uh, importantly, you have this extra minus one for every loop. And that's the consequence of the fact that you have anti-commutation relations as opposed to commutation relations. All right, so this was a summary of what we went over last time. Are there any questions? All right. So, Today, we're going to be talking about S matrices. But before getting to scattering matrices, I want to introduce two. I want to talk about um, one. I want to talk about something that is fully non perturbative uh, about 
the two-point function of an interacting theory. So, so what we were discussing, Feynman diagrams, was a statement about uh, perturbation theory, how we organize that perturbation theory. Now we're going to talk about spectral representation. This is a statement that's fully non-perturbative. Okay, there aren't many such statements we could make about quantum field theory, but they are super valuable. They're very, very valuable. All right. So imagine you have an interacting scalar field. Scalarness of it is just for simplicity. The principle is fully general. You're gonna, we're, we're, let's say you have a, a complex scalar field. So you have the two point function, phi x, phi dagger y, and the interacting vacuum, right? So we can think of it as time order, doesn't matter. I, I, for, for simplicity, I don't put the time ordering for now, but as we go along, I'm gonna include it. Now, in the Hilbert space of quantum field theory, you have a resolution of identity, right? These are eigenstates of the interacting uh, Hamiltonian, and I'm summing over this, this, right? So sum here means sum integral. If the, if the labels are continuous, it's an integral. If the labels are discrete, it's a sum, right? So this is just like some sort of a compact representation, but there is always a resolution of identity in Huber space, right? These are orthogonal. Good. Now consider the interacting Hamiltonian H hat and a particular zero momentum eigenstate, lambda naught. So lambda is some label that labels a particular energy eigenstate. And the eigenvalue of that is m lambda, which is the mass of it, right? So the mass of the, because, because what, what, what is eigenvalue of an Hamiltonian? It's energy, right? What is energy? It's m square root m squared plus p squared, right? But here I'm looking at a zero momentum eigenstate, so it's just going to be mass, right? Now, hopefully you recall that if I have one such state, I can boost it to some other momentum, right? And I get new states, right? And the, Al the Poincaré algebra will tell you how those guys, what is the energy corresponding to those states, but you already know the answer to that, right? All right, is this, is this clear what this notation is? It's important. It's very important what this notation means. So the label lambda here is labeling uh, the energy eigenstates, zero momentum energy eigenstates of an interactive quantum field theory. Good. So something really deep is, we're gonna make a deep statement. Something very deep is gonna happen so in, in the next few slides. So resolution of identity is the sum. There's a piece to it, which is the vacuum, right? And then, there is a sum over all the non-vacuum other energy eigenstates. So Hamiltonian is positive. Energy is positive, right? Mass is positive. Therefore, there's always a zero mass thing. The vacuum is unique. And then there's a sum over lambda. This is the uh, that uh, Lorentz invariant measure we've talked about, right? Ket bra of lambda p, right? Because if you have one a lambda zero, you could just also boost it and we get new states, right? And we use this notation for um, the Lorentz invariant measure. So as I said, lambda is a collective label for quantum numbers of the state. So let's just, to orient ourselves what this, this is all about, let's just think about this expression in free field theory. In free field theory, this is the vacuum. And what you end up with is these, th these guys, are one particle states, two particle states, three particle states, and so on and so forth. And each of the particles, you could boost them, right? So the Hilbert space of a QFT that was free was there was a one particle sector. So the, there are a bunch of labels. Those are the mass and spin, right? For one single particle. And then you can boost it, right? So then if you have two particles, you could individually boost them give them momentum. If you have three particles, you could do that. So these are the multi-particle states, one, two, and so, so on and so forth. However, the two-point function picks up contributions only from single particle states. You know why? Why is that? Why is in free theory, 
the two-point function picking up contributions only from single particle states? Well, we'll see that in a second, but it should be pretty clear. So here's your two-point function. I do, I insert the resolution of identity in the middle, right? So there's a piece which is vacuum, vacuum. So let me just write it down. So there's a piece that is this. I dropped this piece. Does anyone know why? Why did I drop this piece? And this the, term, this yeah, term, there's always a creation or annihilation, right? Yeah, exactly. So just in, think about it in canonical quantization. This is creation annihilation. That create annihilation kills this guy, creation kills this guy, right? So this is a one particle thing. So when you put it here, if lambda p has more than one particle, that this is like a bra with a single particle, and the single particle states are orthogonal to all the other, all the multi-particle states with more than a single particle. So the two-point function in the free theory picks up contributions only from one particle sector, right? So here's the expression that you're dealing with. Um, you could write it this way. This is like this guy squared. I've just taken, I've used the fact that this is an eigenstate of the eigenstate of the momentum operator. So I just can take out the uh, y dependence out, x dependence out, this, this factor. Everything is on shell. So P0 is omega P, and these are four momentum uh, dots mean four momentum in our product. Right, and then this guy is this, and lambda. Now lambda is a sum over all the single particle states of your theory, right? That that all the single particle states that you have in your theory. For instance, if your theory was had one massive scalar field of mass and one some other particles of you know like a bunch of other masses, they will all appear here, but only the single particle ones, right? In the free theory in the free theory, right? And, and the interacting theory, these expressions hold, but it's no longer restricted to a single particle sector. So Lorentz invariance tells you that you could get rid of this P. Does anyone know why? Because this guy and this guy are Lorentz invariant, right? Scalar, transforms trivially under Lorentz transformations, only the point x mu changes. But a Lorentz transformation will fix point zero. So this is invariant. The vacuum is invariant. Therefore, you can get rid of the p. What you end up with is this expression. It's a sum over all the, uh, all the eigenstates that are zero momentum. There is an in momentum integral. This is an unshell momentum integral. This hopefully you recall just the propagator. This is just a propagator, and these are just a bunch of coefficients, right? Putting all of this together, we learn that the two-point function of an interacting quantum field theory in full generality looks like this: sum over lambda d tilde p. This is the um, the uh, invariant measure. Right, Lorentz invariant measure e to the minus i p x uh, dot y. This is the propagator. The propagator looks like this is this a propagator for, yeah, it's a, it's a propagator like a free theory, but this expression is fully for interacting theories, right? I did not assume anything regarding free theories at this point. Good. So this is a non perturbative expression, just logically expanding the two-point function, inserting a resolution of identity in the middle and using Lorentz invariance. All we've done so far is that we have used Lorentz invariance, right? So this is a sum over lambda, the propagator in space for a particle of mass m lambda squared, mass squared m lambda, mass m lambda with these coefficients. Now, we introduce something called the spectral function. The spectral function is this sum, right? So rho q squared, and after this, 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 this is a definition, if you wish. After defining such a uh, 
object such a such a function spectral function this is a step function this is the fact that energy is positive right you know that there you won't end up with any negative uh masses right you plug that in and you find that fully non-perturbatively you can write the time order two-point function of complex scalar field as an integral over d mu squared mu squared mu squared is like mass squared right i rho mu squared over times the property so what does this mean so first of all let's give this a name this is the callan lemon representation right are there any questions about the algebra i did up to here before talking about the interpretation of this i just inserted a resolution of identity i used um Lorentz invariance to massage the time order two-point function in this form, right? Now, it's a deep statement. This is a very, very deep statement. So this is called the callan lemon uh, representation. What does this look like if the theory is free and the particle has mass m squared? It looks like you have to put the spectral function to be the delta function of mu squared minus m squared, right? Because what is this? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I already fully transformed. My bad. Yeah, I fully transformed this, right? So what is this two-point function? This two-point function, in the case of free field theory, is just i over p squared minus m squared plus i epsilon, no integral. This, this tells you that for an interacting theory, inter the two-point function of interacting theory is like a sum over uh, the two-point functions of a whole bunch of free theories. And this rho omega squared, rho mu squared spectral density is sort of saying that the for each particular mass mu squared, how many modes excitations do you have? So interacting theory from the point of view of two-point function looks like summing a bunch of two-point functions of free theories. Now, when I say sum, this is really an integral and this is a density, right? But any interacting theory, the two-point function of it looks like an integral over the two-point functions of the free theory with a density. It's called spectral density. Any questions about this? It's a pretty non-trivial result. I'm going to explain a little bit further. So said differently, Rho Q squared spectral density encodes the spectrum of the theory. Why? Because if you recall, we said when we looked at the propagator, the pole of the propagator was telling us about the mass of the particles in the theory, right? So here is the same story. The pole at P squared equal mu squared is rho mu squared. So spectral density tells you the number of states at a given mu squared. Right? That's a physical interpretation of it. And as I said, in a free theory, there's this is only a Dirac delta function where mu squared is equal to m squared. So an interacting theory from the point of view of propagator looks like a whole bunch of free theories with different masses propagating at the same time. And there, there is a relative density over these guys. This is called the callan lemon representation of the two-point function of uh, quantum field theory. It's fully non-perturbative. Good? Now, if you try to calculate this in perturbation theory, what happens? We saw in the case of a scalar field, when we calculated the propagator in interacting theory, what we found was the propagator of the free theory. There was a one loop integral like this in the five four theory. This was order lambda, right? And then there's order lambda squared. We discovered that the effect of this was to shift the mass. 
right? So what happens to the first order is that this rho omega squared is basically still a Dirac delta function with a shifted mass. This is called renormalized mass. When we haven't done this systematically, but what happens is that there's an overall number that gets multiplied here. And then an interacting theory at order lambda, we didn't discuss this, there are multi-particle states contributing to this, this perturbative expansion. But I wanted to point out this renormalized mass, right? That we found in the in perturbation theory at first order in lambda. So what happens is the, multi, the contribution of the multi-particle states gives you a continuum with Q squared starting in the vicinity of 2M squared, 4M squared, right? This is the threshold for pair production. So if you view this rho mu squared spectral density on the complex Q squared plane, right? You're, uh, oh, sorry, it's not rho mu squared, my bad. Um, if you view the two-point function, so this is the two-point function in the momentum space, right? Spectral density is about the uh, residues, right? You have a single particle pole here. Then you have two particle pole. If the theory were free, then the this pole is 4m squared because it's 2m is the, the for free theory, 2m is the mass energy of, if it costs m, to create a single particle, to create a pair of particles, 2m. Now, in an interacting theory, that's not literally true. So you will have, you will start a, this point, this pole will be somewhere near 4m squared, right? So there will be lambda corrections to it. Now there is, here you have a branch cut, meaning that it's expected that you have a pole at any value here. Does anyone, can anyone, argue for that. There's a very simple, simple argument for that. So what does this mean? It means that the moment you have enough energy to create a pair of particles at rest, right? Now, there's always an excitation that corresponds to, that has zero momentum, but energy arbitrarily close to that. Why is that? Zero momentum. I mean, you can just create the two particles flying in opposite directions. Exactly, precisely. So you create a pair of particles at rest, you give this momentum P, you give this momentum minus P. This total state has zero momentum, but you get to give them how much P you want. So you, you use 2M to create the particle, right? But then you put a net amount of momentum, you add a net amount of momentum to it and energy increases, right? So that is why you have a continuum. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Recording failed to start. I'm not quite sure what that meant. Oh, well, it's too late. Um, all right. So here you have a branch cut. Branch cut means that you expect to, in this integral, to pick up contributions from rho mu squared for all values of mu squared larger than four m squared, right? So there will be three particle, four particles. So three particle would appear here where there will be a new pole here near nine m squared. And there will be another branch cut there. There will be one near 16 m squared. There will be another branch cut. So this function on the complex plane has many, many branch cuts. It's a very complicated function, right? But it's not surprising because we're talking about uh, the two-point function of an arbitrary quantum field theory, right? Is this principle clear? So this is the Lemon, um, callan lemon representation. Any questions? I can tell you that if you have a question, please do ask. It took me a long, long time to understand this simple catalan lemon representation. It's a, it's a deep statement. There aren't many non-perturbative statements that are true in quantum field theory, but this is one of them. 
Right, well, it's the physical meaning of branch cut. So across the branch cut, then the two point function is multi value function, right? Exactly. So yeah. Okay. Is it physical okay. then? Sorry. Is it physical? I mean, multi value two point function is physical. Yeah. So um, absolutely, of course. That that's perfectly uh that that's perfectly physical. So the what it means is that you need information. If you have an analytic function, right? You have a function that's analytic in some domain. Say the function is analytic in this domain. You don't need any information. You just you use this trick called analytic uh, continuation. So mathematics and smoothness, actually, uh, the fact that it's analytic will fix for you the function, right? If you have a poll, you need some extra knowledge. It's the residue of the poll. If you want to understand how the function behaves, you need an extra piece of information, which is the residue of the poll. When you have this branch cut of this form, which is a whole bunch of uh, polls, like sitting on this line, it means that you need a function worth of information. The function worth is rho mu squared. Right, that's a physical interpretation of it. You need extra information to fix the function. Oh, I see. Good. Mm -hmm. Thanks. For example, what that what does that mean? It means that if you were to perform an inter so when you have a poll, right, on the complex plane, the information that you're missing is about an integral that goes around this, right? As we go around this. You start with some value, you go around this, you don't end up with the same, well, you go around this and you the, the total integral is, uh, this is Cauchy's theorem, right? Is to calculate that, you have to know how to have the knowledge of the residue. So here, if you have a bunch of correlation function and you wanna continue them through the branch cut, you need the, you need the information, which is this function, right? So this is some information that you need to fix the function. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Any Thanks. other questions? All right. We will come back and talk about this Z in the next section of this course. This is where the renormalization is. So um, per, uh, perturbative renormalization. So you should keep in mind that if you recall from this uh, Feynman diagram, when we evaluated the shift in the math, we found it to be infinite, right? This was an infinite amount. And then we said, eventually we'll deal with it. So this guy is also infinite. We'll, we'll come back to this and deal with it properly at some point. Next, in the next part. Any other questions? All right. So now let's talk about S matrices and LSC reduction. Actually, let me let me tell you something that you rarely hear about in quantum field theory. What we're discussing, what we teach these days as quantum field theory is called, deserves to be called Lagrangian for, uh, formulation of quantum field theory. When quantum for, field theory started, there were many approaches to it. Lagrangian formulation was one such approach. And over the course of time, Lagrangian formulation gained more traction. It was pr proved to be more useful. It doesn't mean that this is the only way to talk about quantum field theory. There is another formulation of quantum field theory, which was called the S matrix theory. So S matrix theory was trying to say that to reconstruct a quantum field theory only from the knowledge of S matrices. So today we're going to discuss something that's called LSC reduction. LSC reduction tells you how to go from correlation functions, which is some information from the Lagrangian formalism, to the S matrix, right? This, this is also another very, very deep result. And that's also non-perturbative in quantum field theory. And it, it sits at the heart of the idea of S matrix. So let me just say, a little bit more about this. So we said that uh, quantum field theory, uh, some observables you could define for it are correlation functions. 
We also said that uh, scattering matrices could be uh, observables. Now, LST formula, LST reduction formula, tells you how to think about the S matrix in the language of correlation functions. So in a sense, it's sort of like when this was developed, it was developed as a way of connecting two different approaches to quantum work. All right, so recall what the S matrix is. The S matrix is the overlap of asymptotic states, beta out, alpha in. Beta is the wave function of multiple particles of the free theory at plus infinity, and alpha is the wave function of multiple particles and minus infinity in time. These were called, we call these asymptotic states. To define asymptotic states, I just said, let's hope or wish or assume that interactions were very, very weak at minus infinity in time and are very, very weak in plus infinity in time. So somehow um, they just die away. You, we, I, I said that you adiabatically turn it on and off. Now, this is a big assumption. And in some theories, it doesn't work. For example, any theory with long range interactions, this assumption fails. So it is a big topic in quantum field theory that is not fully, fully resolved yet, whether or not you could properly define S matrix for a theory with long range interactions. An example of that would be electromagnetism. An example of that would be non-abelian gauge theories that are you know, with massless uh, modes, right? So you turns out, long story short, this is like literally a few months ago, there was a deep paper about this. This is still work in development. Um, the, the message, if you want to know in advance, is that you could define S matrix, but it's a little bit tricky. So if you want to know about more details of mathematical definition of this, I recommend that you guys read Weinberg's book, volume one. Weinberg has a very beautiful discussion of this in his work, in case you're interested. I think that discussion is way too advanced to teach in a first course in QFT. All right, any questions about asymptotic states? The notion of an asymptotic state. Is it good? Okay. Does anyone, do you guys have an idea of asymptotic states in quantum mechanics, which is zero plus one dimensional QFT? So what is scattering in quantum mechanics? You have some sort of a potential like this, right? You send in a wave from here, part of it is reflected, part of it goes through. Right? This is a simple one particle scattering in quantum mechanics. There's a off of a potential. Why did I take a, a free wave? Why did I take e to the power of i px? Because I assumed out at infinity, the potential is zero. And if the potential is zero, the solution to shorting your equations is just e to the power of ix. Right? This is an eigenstate of fixed energy, fixed momentum. Right, so this wave coming from minus minus x is an asymptotic state. This guy going to plus x plus infinity x is an asymptotic state. Right, so and the assumption that interaction dies away is the assumption that the potential out at infinity is just zero. Good. Very good. Okay. Now, sorry, now, now one point here. What does it mean to have long range interaction that this potential falls off not fast enough at infinity so that you could approximate the solution to equations of motion at infinity with free theory, right? That's what it means. For example, a parallel fall off is often not, depending on the dimension, is not fast enough. So Exponent the exponentials are, are fast enough. Exponentials are great. Okay. All right. So um, 
assuming that there are no long range forces, these asymptotic states are free particles, right? The LST formula tells you the S tells you about what the S matrix is. This is the S matrix in terms of amputated correlation functions. So correlation function, if you recall, uh, always came if there were if you have some sort of diagram and you had a bunch of well, I shouldn't call it correlation anyway. Um, if you had external legs, they always came with the propagator of the external legs. Amputated means just take the bare thing and drop the um, the drop the external legs propagators, right? This is called LSC, as in Lehman, Simanzig, Zimmerman, three people who developed this uh, back in the days. All right, so let's think about this. What is the S matrix? It's the overlap of beta out, some wave function of multiple free particles at plus infinity in time, and alpha n, some wave function of free particles at minus infinity in time, right? So it's, you could you could write it as a matrix between n, n, and that matrix is the S matrix, right? So you could also write it as out, out, and that matrix is S, S dagger. So out, out could be written in terms of N, N as S, S dagger, right? Now, we have a constraint here. S, S dagger has to be identity, right? Why, why is that? Do you guys know why? Time evolution is unitary, right? If the theory is tra time translation invariant, if the action is time translation invariant, that's the symmetry of the theory. Wigner taught us it has to be represented on the Hilbert space by a unitary, right? And this, this S does that job. So S, S dagger has to be identity. This is a U S matrix is a unitary matrix. This is... In quantum field theory, when people talk about unitarity, you might hear this like casual use in, uh, by physicists. They mean the unitarity of the S matrix. Most they mostly mean this. Good. So now here's an expression. You could write down the S matrix in terms of the generating functional, the generating functional of correlation functions. How your ZJ is the generating functional. You're gonna take del i del j y put k y here and phi hat n y this is the free field and this is the free propagator so i invite you guys to think about why is this the s matrix but the s matrix could be written fully non-perturbatively in the following form So if you take the S matrix and sandwich it with beta N and alpha N, right? You learn that this expression, the S matrix, picks up contributions from endpoint functions, right? GN, because there are, this is e to the power of this derivative. When you expand the exponential, there is this guy to the power of N. So there's a contribution coming from GN. But each factor gn sits next to n copies of the free propagator and n copies of this phi hat, right? Now, this the job of these free propagators is to kill the external legs, external propagators that you find in the in gn. That's why when you sandwich this in beta n alpha n as matrix elements of the S matrix, the result is th this expression writes the result in terms of the amputated green functions. So this might sound very formal, but we're gonna do examples of it. Are there any questions about the grand picture, the basic framework? We're gonna go through examples of it. I mean, that's going to be most of what you do. You're gonna calculate S matrices.
precisely in this way. I will come back to this uh, in the next lecture. And let me see, actually. I will come back to this in the next lecture and describe more about the what is going on, the physics of it, because it's, it's a deep statement. But let me summarize where we are so far. So what we did so far was we mentioned two non-perturbative results in quantum field theory. The first result said that the two-point function of the interacting theory, the time order two-point function interacting theory, looks like an integral over the two-point function of a free theory with mass, some arbitrary mass, and that are each mass that appears in the integral has a weight function, rho of mu squared. We said this rho of mu squared could be interpreted as the number of the density, I guess the density of particles of that mass. We said that in a theory, um, say massive free fields, right? You expect in the, in the analytic, the, the two-point function on the complex plane, you expect this to have a pull at a single particle mass. That is the renormalized mass. And then there will be a, um, another pull at the threshold for pair creation, the minimum amount of energy you need to pair create. Do you guys have a sense of how could pair creation energy, minimum energy, be less or more than 2 m squared? What kind of interaction gives leads to the fact that pair creation requires less energy than 4 m squared? It's about the binding energy of the pair, right? If the binding energy of the pair is positive or negative, that tells you how much energy you have to use. We said that once you have the pair creation, you reach the pair creation threshold, you could give these guys relative momenta, relative but opposite momenta, or as you wish, so that, well, opposite momenta, so that you, you have a continuous spectrum beyond that, right? So you have in the, in the language of, uh, in the language of the two-point function, you have a branch cut past this point, and there's a branch cut at 9m squared, 16m squared, blah, near 9 squared, m squared, 16m squared, right? This is called the Callum Lemon representation of the two-point function. Then we talked about the S matrix, and another result is a rewriting of the S matrix in terms of green functions, amputated green functions. The way it works, well, first we said that the S matrix has to be unitary in a theory where time translation is a symmetry, right? That means that the matrix elements of S, S dagger are just direct delta function or sorry, chronic or delta, whatever you want to call it, it's direct delta. This expression is the LSC formula. It's just, it tells you how to calculate the S matrix in terms of the generating functional. Now the S matrix picks up a contribution from n point green functions and the coefficients are like this. This free propagator is there to cancel out the free propagators in GN such that the result is an amputated green function. So that is what we said. Any questions so far? So if you have a free theory, what is the S matrix? What's the S matrix of a free theory? Think about it in this language. It's just identity. So if you want to know the contribution of interaction to the S matrix, you want to write down the S matrix as identity plus I sum matrix. That I is conventional. Why is that? Why, why do we put I, by the way? Does anyone know why we put I? 
So that T becomes Hermitian? Yeah, Hermitian. Exactly. Well, it's not necessarily Hermitian, but because this is an, an exponential, in perturbation theory, if you were to expand this, the first order term would be one plus I something, right? We often talk about this T hat as a matrix. I call it, yeah, this is a matrix, but this is a matrix in the Hilbert space of the free theory, right? Now, we calculate that- What do you mean by that statement? Like it's a matrix, like, or what do you want to like emphasize about that? Look at this, right? Mm -hmm. So what is this S matrix? It's the matrix, I've written it, the matrix elements of it are in the Hilbert space of in, in, mm -hmm. right? In Hilbert space is a free theory. Okay. Right? This is the magic of the S matrix. You're not asking, because you're asking it about a transition amplitude from minus infinity in time to plus infinity in time, you get to formulate everything in terms of something at the some data that is defined in the free Hilbert space. Good. Mm -hmm. This these are deep concepts. Any any other questions? But it's the same story actually in quantum mechanics as well. Scattering matrix is always like that. In scattering matrices, you don't ask the details of what goes on in the middle during the interaction. You just throw in. It's like a box. You throw in something at it at minus infinity time, you're totally oblivious of what goes on. You just look at the, you compare the final result at plus infinity to the final, to the initial result at minus infinity. Now, here's an important thing. I assume that the out Hilbert space and the in Hilbert space are unitarily equivalent. That's also another assumption that has to do with that's only really true if the interactions die fast enough but these are these are formal technical issues you don't need to worry about all right okay so let's focus on the matrix elements of it in some initial ket k ket pi p right so this this is like a collection of momenta p1 p2 p3 p4 these are like some four particles, I don't know, for example, of initial momenta, and then these are some a bunch of particles of final momenta. We saw that there is, no matter what, there's momentum conservation, right? So there is a piece of this that they could take out. This is just initial momenta minus final momenta, four vectors have to be direct delta function. That's just a condition that it follows from the fact that the theory is time translation. Time and space time translation invariant, Poincare invariance, right? Translation invariance tells you this bit. So you could always take this out and talk about I M K to P. This is called the invariant matrix element. In most calculations of quantum field theory, this is what we work with. But hopefully now you know how to what the logic is, right? Because we use the formal formal principle, like uh, basic principles, Lorentz invariance, translation invariance, to abstract out this piece. The rest is fixed, right? So this is the piece that's called invariant matrix element, and we're going to compute it. Now, I won't have time today to go through uh, this connection that I'm going to say, but in quantum field theory, what we observe is cross-section. Cross-section and in scattering, in the problem, in the scattering problem, the thing that we observe is cross-section, right? Do you guys know what the, uh, as an observable, what is the dimension of cross-section? Dimensional analysis of it. I will go through this at some point later, but like, I guess you guys are not it's very- It's just familiar. area, right? Exactly, it's cross-section area. It tells you about the effective area where the interaction happens. We'll, we'll discuss this later. But cross-section, uh, let me tell you in advance, once we formulate everything, right? Cross-section is the observable of interest, and it becomes proportional 
to m norm of m squared, m m star. This is a complex number, right? This is a matrix element, so this is a number, right? And this is a number. So m squared times parameters, the rest of which are fixed by kinematics of the problem, which means that what kind of initial particle did you particles you picked, what was the initial and final wave functions, the geometry you put in, whatever you put in comes out. But this bit is the result that has to do with the interaction. It's not m that is observable, it's m squared. Not surprisingly, M is the overlap in quantum mechanics. Born rules, born rule tells you that the overlap is not observable. The norm of it is probabilities, right? This is sort of like a whoops. This is like probability, right? We'll, we'll we'll discuss that. We'll discuss that in more detail. But I want to tell you in advance that the what we are going to be after is this M squared. In perturbation theory, you could write this matrix element as just the insertion of e to minus i integral of v interaction between p and k. Hopefully you recall that, we, we, we discussed that. All right, so let's discuss this systematically. What are we after? Today, we're gonna try to go through a few examples of calculations of S matrix, whatever, as much as time allows, right? I think we're gonna run out of time, but uh, we're gonna calculate M for today. On Thursday, we're gonna calculate M squared, but uh, today we're just gonna calculate the amplitude, right? And eventually we're gonna calculate the full cross section and describe all the other details that go into it, right? So, Let's first discuss the incoming and outgoing particles. These are asymptotic states. If you have a scalar field, the incoming particle is a wave function e to minus ip dot x. So four, uh, these are four momenta. Do I need to say anything extra? You guys recall? This has to be on shell, right? Because it's free theory. But I... I basically arrange for that by keeping in mind that when I write my integrals, I'm going to put the Lorentz invariant measure. Or I'm going to put the propagator, the proper proper uh, proper, uh, proper propagator, right, um, in there. The outgoing particle is the wave function is e to i p dot x, right? These are the outgoing. These are hopefully familiar with from scattering in, in quantum mechanics, right? If you have fermions, your incoming and outgoing wave functions are four vectors, right? So you have a fermion. Recall there was u of p of e to minus px. There is a label s, which was spin. So hopefully you recall from uh, quantization of Dirac field. The anti-fermion is this v bar of p e to minus px. There are spin indices in here. The outgoing fermion and antifermion, this would be U bar and this would be VP and the signs are flipped. For photons, the incoming photon, this is a polarization vector. E to IPX. For outgoing photon, this is a polarization vector to start with, complex conjugate. For photons, we're gonna come to this when we discuss QED and discuss this in a lot more detail. I just wanna say this because some of the examples that we're going to look at, I want you to know in advance how this generalizes if you replace one of these scalars with photons. Okay? Any questions about incoming and outgoing particles? So these are the incoming and outgoing wave functions for single particles. Are we good? All right. So let's start with the simplest theory of interest for us. Yukawa theory. It's actually a theory that's physical. It describes interactions of elementary particles. So let's say we're in three plus one dimension as we are. We have a real scalar field phi and a Dirac fermion psi. The Hamilton, the Lagrangian is going to the action is going to be the action of a real scalar field. Hopefully you recall that. And Dirac fermion is a Dirac 
action. We're going to add an interaction term like this, G psi bar psi phi. G is the Yukawa coupling, and it's called Yukawa because you couple a scalar to Dirac fermions. You couple with somebody who studied this model. There's only one interaction term in the Hamiltonian, so there's only one vertex. The vertex is this. A fermion comes, fermion goes out, and this dashed line is the scalar. I could be discussing anti-fermion, anti-fermion um, scalar interaction. What does that look like? Recall that the direction as a flow of charge is the direction of the arrow. So that's what it looks like. But let's stick with this. So we're going to talk about fermion, fermion, scalar vertex. We're going to calculate fermion, fermion scattering. So the in particles are going to be a pair of fermions, right? So these are the pair of incoming particles. The outgoing particles are going to be a pair of fermions. Here are, are the, oh, sorry. <laughs> these are the incoming fermions and these are the outgoing fermions. Good. All right. So let's write it down. The matrix elements, this is what we're after. We have a pair of incoming, P and K are the incoming momenta. Outgoing momenta are P prime and K prime because I have a pair of particles, right? And I stick in the interaction in the middle. I expand it. How can I, so I have these guys coming and going, right? The only way that I can end up with some sort of interaction is I need two vertices, right? And those vertices would correspond to propagation, the propagation of a scalar. So all the diagrams we could draw, there are these two, right? Here, P comes, there's an interaction through a scalar and goes, K comes, K prime, or this one. These are two diagrams I can draw. So let's calculate them. But I can I can derive these these expressions. So plug in the first order, the, the term that, that corresponds to the tree level, no loops, right? So you will have to insert two copies of the vertex in there. So here's one copy of the vertex, psi bar psi phi of x, phi psi bar psi at point y, right? Of course, as we, if you recall from Born series, you have to integrate over x and y, right? D4 of x, D4 of y. This is the, the two is the symmetry factor, right? And uh, this is the vertex. You have to do weak contractions for this correlator. There's only a pair of phi's in there. They contract and give you scalar free propagator. So here it is. So in there's minus i g two integral of dx dy i delta f of x minus y because of the contraction of these two guys x and y. Right? Is that good? Now you have two sides here, a pair of sides here, two sides here, two sides here. These guys contract here. These guys contract here. Right? So here we go. P and K come in. Right? So P, U of S, U of S prime of K, they come in. They, have, they can have different spins, so S and S prime, right? What comes out is U prime of S prime of P prime and U prime of S prime K prime. I already knew that this S prime, this, the spin of these two guys should be the same. Why is that, you guys know? Because the interaction involves a scalar. Scalar doesn't have spin. The incoming quantum numbers and the outgoing quantum numbers should be the same. Conservation loss, right? So I already plug that in. Delta S and delta S prime. You you can just put extra variables, but when you write down the propagator, you learn that there is, if you recall, it was diagonal in the SS prime basis. These are just the factors that you obtain from uh, in, in momentum space, right? 
Now you have two such diagrams. One is this, the other one is the same, but the P prime and K prime are swapped. There's a minus sign in the middle. Do you know how I deduce the minus sign? Is Pauli's exclusion principle. Why is the minus sign Pauli's exclusion principle? Because in the case that P prime and K prime are the same and S and S prime are the same, the amplitude should vanish, right? That's just Pauli's exclusion principle. A pair of fermions cannot occupy the exact same uh, state. The only labels we have for the states are the spin and momentum. So your final states, your final answer should be such that if you put, if you set equal the external quantum numbers, because these are fermions, the amplitude should vanish. The only way for to arrange for that is to put the minus sign here. So the statistics fixes the sign, relative sign between the two diagrams. But you could derive this more formally using just like uh, anti-commutation relations. This is a quick way of seeing it. All right, so this is the amplitude. Are there any questions? We're gonna work on this still more, but where, where these expressions come from? This is just examples of Feynman diagrams. So we had this propagator and there is X and Y dependence. There's a bunch of phases. We could perform the X and Y integrals, right? Because these are just a bunch of phases and these are just some integrals of this. What do you give? You, what do you get? You just get Fourier transform. You get the propagator of the boson in momentum space. That's all you get, right? And you get a conservation law, right? Integral of d4x, d4y of this guy, this expression. We did that before, right? You get, uh, oops, you get the conservation of momentum, right? And the propagator for the boson. So these two expressions, I just copied them here. This expression I copied there here. Minus sign is the minus sign. I performed an integral over this factor and this, and this factor and this, right? The result is just the propagator free boson. Here it is one over P minus P squared, P prime squared minus M squared, P minus K prime squared minus M squared. How do I know these expressions? Well, conservation laws. P comes, P prime goes. So what propagates here is P prime minus P. What comes here is P, what goes out is K prime. So this propagator is P minus K prime. So here is the second propagator. Here's the first propagator, P minus P prime squared. What did I compute here? This is the T matrix, right? Recall the S matrix was one plus I, then I times T, right? I wrote, there was a, if I already wrote this expression. When I expand E to minus I integral V int, there's one. I just dropped that term and I wrote the first non-trivial term. That's why it's I T, I'm computing the I T, right? So this is the T matrix. Questions? Is that good? We said that the, if you look at the T matrix, just by translation invariance, there is always this factor two by four, this guy. So if I just drop it, I get this matrix element, invariant matrix element, M, that I defined. Remember what this was defined, how we defined this? So S was I, I plus identity plus it and then i defined i to look at this it hat and i said there is the conservation law whatever remains is i m so i drop the conservation law expression and i obtain i m this is the i m good the expressions are fairly simple now the Picture is hopefully physical, right? So this diagram is like this, right? And this diagram is like this. All you have is, oops, just 
this guy is this propagator, this guy is this propagator. There are four external legs. These are the wave functions outside, right? And there's a relative minus sign, g squared, because it's the second, there's a factor of ig for each of these guys. Good? That's like Legos. We really put together the pieces. That's what Feynman diagrams are all about at this level. At tree level, it's just Legos. When you go, when you go to uh, loops, you will have to, it's Legos plus integrals. You have to do integrals. So that, that's going to be where the pain is. But any questions about this? So we computed the a contribution the first order non-trivial contribution, which happened to be G squared, to the scattering of fermion fermion in a Yukawa theory. Now, just as another example of calculation, we could consider the fermion antifermion scattering. Now, when a fermion and antifermion come in, right, they could annihilate. What does that mean? That diagram is exactly this. They come, two, two fermion, a fermion and anti-fermion come in, and the external particles are, whoops, and the external, and they, after the interaction, you end up with a pair of scalars, right? That's a two to two matrix, two fermion and fermion, anti-fermion come in, and you release, the result of the interaction is that you release two scalars. Now, these two diagrams have a plus in the middle. Do you guys know why? There is a no anti-symmetric uh, relation, anti-communicator between the, the under particle and the particle. Yeah, so, well, the, the plus has to do with the final states because, you know, see, this part of the diagram is the same. The only thing that's happened is swapping the final states. But the final states are bosons. So when you swap them, is you pick up a plus sign, right? Fermions, when you swap them, you pick up a minus sign, right? It's commutation and anti-commutation relations. Good? So you know in advance where this is going. There will be two vertices, so that's minus ig squared. There is this leg, this leg, so V bar of S, U of S prime. There's a propagator of fermion for P minus P prime here, right? And this is V bar of S of K, I S of uh, P minus K of U of S prime, right? This is what this is. So in the next lecture, so here we calculate two amplitudes. What we'll have to do is we'll have to square it. We'll have to calculate m star m. That's the probability. And integrate it against some sort of geometric factors. That is kinematics. We'll give you the cross-section, which is the observable of the theory. But if you're a formal theorist, you should be pretty happy already because you have the overlap. You've calculated the overlap, right? Between some initial and final state. This is, these are, this is a flavor of what S matrix calculations look like in uh, at tree level without loops yet. All right, any questions so far? So we ran out of time. Any questions? So in summary, what did we do today? We discussed two non-perturbative results in quantum field theory that are very essential. One of them was kallen lemon representation of the two-point function of the interacting theory as an integral over the two-point function of free theory with a mass which appears with a density. That density we call spectral density. We said we expect the spectral density to have, in a theory with a mass gap, we expect the spectral density to have a pole. Sorry, we expect that two-point function to have a pole for a single particle, uh, single particle, and then there will be a threshold for pair creation beyond which you have a branch cut. Um, then we talked about LSC formula. LSC formula was a formula. I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll try to talk about that in the next lecture as well from a different perspective. It's an expression that gives you the S matrix in terms of the generating functional, the amputated green, amputated green functions, right? 
Then we started our calculation of the scattering matrix. We said that there is a piece to it, which is identity that due to free propagation. We remove that, the result is IT hat, we called it. It's a matrix that captures the interaction content of it. We said that this IT hat always, because of conservation laws, is always proportional to this two pi to the power of D, blah, 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 direct delta function that conserves momenta, right? You take that piece out, you end up with this part that is the essence of the calculation, this matrix element IM, right? We calculate, we did two sample calculations of this IM scattering matrix, right? In Yukawa theory, one of them was fermion to fermion, three level scattering, two fermions going to two fermions. The other one was a fermion anti fermion, uh, creating a pair of scalars in the Yukawa theory. Any questions? All right. If not, thank you so much, guys. Have a nice day. Thank you.